morning. Uh, thanks, Hein. And uh, look, I've got a few slides I want to take you through. And in many ways, I want to bring you on a story of what's happened over the last four years. Uh, and then I'm going to open up for some questions. And I'm looking forward to those because, you know, the key point I want to get across is as a person who's been involved in large organisations, in information problems, uh, and in touch, I've been involved in the health sector since 1996. Um, we've got a problem, and we haven't really done this very well, and we've got to get a whole lot better. Now, having said that, in the last four years, we've just started to show signs that we think we know how to do some things well. And uh, today, I'm hoping to encourage all of you to want to get more involved, because this is your health system, and you need to help us create it the way that you want it to operate. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is not only clinical leadership, but one of the reasons that uh, Hein and the gentleman in the meeting that I went to looked at each other in a strange way is I made some broad comments about leadership in general. And uh, I'm going to warm you up first, but I will come to that a little later in my presentation. But I want to start because I understand it's been 25 years since uh, you've been in place, and I want to just put 25 faces in front of you. These are 25 clinicians who have worked with me over the last four years to make a difference. And they're outstanding. And every one of them has put their reputation on the line in order to lead a change in the way the health system operates. And we'll see those faces as we work through my presentation. So the first thing is, what changed? In 2009, the Minister of Health, Tony Ryle, suggested that we had to do IT a whole lot better, and we had to make it more about e-health, not just about IT systems. And we had to get IT out from the back office, and we had to get it out in the front line of service delivery. And so we wrote a plan, and we created something called the National Health IT Board, and I set that up. I basically was the author with Tony Cook from Hutt Valley to write the plan. Uh, we published it, and we've updated it in 2013. Now, I'm not sure if many of you know about the plan, but it only had one criticism. It didn't have enough IT and technology in it. So all the CIOs avidly read through the 25 pages and said, well, where's all the IT? Because the presentation and the discussion and the plan that I'll come to, because you only need to know about three things out of the plan, but it's all about how we want to operate together. It's about how consumers and clinicians and executives want to operate the health system. And then it's about IT automating some of those parts of the health system that we know well and that we're confident that we know how we want to standardise it. So IT has to be part of the solution, not the whole solution. So I know that you, li you like to cut to the chase, and so let's cut to the chase. There are just three things you need to know about the IT plan. The first thing is everything we do has got to be about collecting information about people. It's got to be about collecting them in prevention, in their care cycles, in their long-term conditions, and it's got to be about them, about their family, about their outcomes, and it's got to be shared openly and confidently. And we've got a wonderful privacy legislation in New Zealand that says as long as you tell people what you're going to do with their data, and they agree, you're allowed to do it. What a wonderful idea. So the power is already with the consumers, but sometimes in the health system we seem to translate that into a whole lot of barriers to not allow sharing. So the first point is we've got to share data, it's got to be person-centred and standards-based. The second thing is, as I intimated at the start of my presentation, we're building a health system that is um, organised, led and run by 120,000 health professionals. And you're a key part of that group. So we've got to design it in a way that you're happy with it. When an IT system comes to your and part of the health system, it's got to be easy to use, it's got to be intuitive. It's got to be linked up with the people who've done the work before you've got involved and the people who are going to do the work after you're involved. So we've got to get co-design and co-production with clinicians, consumers, get them in the room, get them to understand what it is we're trying to do, and IT professionals who then it is their job to design high quality solutions. And then the last one, which um, is the third point of the plan said, and then we need the guys with the checkbooks, and when I say guys, I mean guys and girls, uh, we need the people with the checkbooks to actually be confident investors, to invest in their part of the health system. And we use this language, the health ecosystem, because if we're truly going to understand consumers when they're well, and consumers who are at risk, and consumers who then need intervention and care, 
then we need to understand the whole ecosystem, the way NGOs work with people. We need to understand how social services work with people. And then we need to understand how the absolute top end of clinical care is going to connect into that ecosystem. And this is why around the world, health IT has been a huge black hole of investment without a huge outcome, because it's complex, it's hard. So the key thing out of this point, though, is our investors, the people who hold the purse strings, have got to be given business cases they want to invest in, and then we've got to deliver them, not just for the individual organisation, whether that's a DHB or a primary healthcare unit or an NGO, but they've got to invest so they're joined up to everybody else, because that's what patients expect. And so they are the three points that came out of the plan, and we've been working and driving these three points in everything the IT board does over the last four years. Now, the other thing we needed was an idea of a vision. We needed an idea of what are we trying to get to. And this is the ecosystem. So this is a picture that comes from the King's Fund. It's been adopted by Canterbury DHB and more and more by the whole of the South Island. And I truly ask you, when these slides get given to you, put it in your back pocket and take it back to your organisation and say, why aren't we organised like this? It has a very simple concept. You put the person and the family and the house and the community in the centre. And you say everything the health system's trying to do is prevent people getting to the outside. This is like Hunger Games, you know? Keep the people in the centre and don't let them get to the outside. Now, if they get to the outside, we want the highest quality workup for those people to have come through general practice, to have come through the specialist services, to have the scanning and the MRIs and whatever else they need, the diagnostics, so that when they come to the hospital door, we know about them. We know who they are. They don't have to tell their story again and again and again. Just the number of times that people tell me that they come to a hospital, they give their story at the front desk, they walk down the corridor and have to start again. Why do we do that to our poor um, customers, patients, consumers? So we needed at the IT board a vision of the future, and this is the vision we've selected, because we then needed to think about the information systems that would underpin that. And you've heard me say information systems and the point that I want to get across to you is we want a small number of information systems that really know about each other. We can't just have one. Around the world, they've tried to do one. In the UK, I don't know if you're aware, they split the UK into four, and they went out to get one system to run the population for that quarter of the UK, and everyone went out of business. £12 billion of government funding was spent for no outcome, and four IT companies went out of business. So clearly that's not the right answer. So we've got to think differently. We've got a hybrid model that we're working to, and it's in these four layers. Now, the other thing that I find fascinating about information solutions is you've got to agree who's going to own the information system, not just to invest in it, but to operate it safely forever. So let's imagine for a moment that we were a bank and we're going to have an FPOS system running, but we want all the banks to be able to use the FPOS system because merchants and customers want that to work every time. So let's assume that a bank set up an FPOS system, but all the other banks weren't connected to it. So depending on which store you went, if you were with ANZ Bank, you could buy something, but if you went to the store next door, you couldn't. You'd need a Westpac card. Well, that's crazy. So how did the bank solve it? They created a company called ETSL. They all took part shares in it and they made sure it operated really, really well on behalf of all of them. Now, at the bottom of this diagram here are those same sorts of foundational health information solutions that we need for our health system. And luckily enough, we don't have to create ETSL because we have a ministry that has already shown itself in this area to be very efficient and very good at doing this. So at the bottom of our tree is the National Health Index and the Health Provider Index and the uh, alerts and, and medical warning system and a few other systems that we only want to do once in the country because they are so critical to how the way the health system operates everywhere else. The real key though, as you look at this diagram here, and I won't spend too much time on it because I want to get on to a couple of examples. But imagine that you've had a full life and you've, you were born maybe a couple of years ago and you're getting on to maybe 80, 90 years old. Just imagine how much information is going to be collected about your health experiences over your lifetime. So a child born today is going to go straight into an NHI system. They're going to be captured in the national maternity system. Plunkett have a new system for well child, so their data will be sitting there. We have a before schools check. We, I could just keep on going all the way through our lifetime. What's going to happen to all that information? 
And we think this tree, this wonderful old Pahutakawa tree that's over 100 years old and in the Hauraki Gulf, is a way of describing how, if we do it well, the information will play out over a lifetime. If we get the foundations and the roots right so that the NHI is correct and always correct, and all the data that is collected is collected in these three layers on top of that, then New Zealanders can be confident their health information is uh, accurate, high quality, and able to be used right across the continuum of care. So let me describe a couple of other examples. There's a lot of work going on from the IT board in rolling out a concept called a patient portal in the community. And a patient portal in simplistic terms, and I'll give you a little bit more info on this, is it's allowing New Zealanders to go home at night and log in and have a look at their health information as seen primarily in their primary care general practice. Now most of us are well, and in fact the large part of the community just simply want to be able to log in and see the episodes of care, they might be able to have a secure message. And around the world, this is a project that has almost failed in every case. And that's because people like me around the world have stepped up and said, well, that's all right, we know how to do patient portals. We'll choose one and we'll roll it out from the centre of the country. So Australia's done this. They have something called a personally controlled electronic health record. And it hasn't gone very well. It hasn't gone well for two reasons. One is, do you really want to log into a government system to have a look at your personal health information? And do you, are you confident that the people in Canberra are going to know how your interactions with every specialist, GP, pharmacist, etc., all of the health providers, all that information somehow is going to snake its way back to Canberra and give a quality view of my health information? Clearly not, because they've forgotten about the ownership question. For a patient portal to work, it must be tied to someone who's clinically leading and coordinating the care for that individual. And again, in New Zealand, we're very lucky. We have our general practice, not just the GP, but the whole general practice team who do that very, very well. So in New Zealand, we're rolling out patient portals by general practice. They get a, cho a choice of four different uh, tools they can use, and it's a service extension to the work they're doing. Okay, now as you can tell, I could carry on talking about these for a long time, but I do want to just talk about hospital e-prescribing, which is the one out on the right. Um, you know, I could have come along four years ago with my IT board and suggested that every DHB uh, stop using the systems they use and all come onto a big American-based system and, and we'd be away. But actually, we know there's a long history of bringing in US and, and European-based systems and actually finding them very, very difficult to implement into our public system. So we picked just a small number of things to do well and consistently well. And one of those was hospital e-prescribing. So there is only one system. We've selected a product called MedChart. Internationally, it is as good as any of the other systems, and it's been proven in a Sydney trial against another software tool. So we know it's very, very good. It's been trialled in three DHBs. It works extremely well, and more importantly, we know how to implement it. We know the sort of clinical leadership you need, the change management, and we know how it works backwards. So that's been rolled out into a fourth DHB and is ready to roll out throughout the country over the next two years. But there's a question, are the DHBs ready to pick it up? So this is the plan uh, for the last 12 months, the, the current year we're in. This is what the IT board does. Uh, it's focused on everything to do with e-medicines on the top left because we've decided that's a critical element right across our health system from community and into secondary and tertiary and quaternary care and back into the community. So we're working incredibly hard to get a single system into the community around e-prescriptions, around med rec, which is the transition in and out of hospital, and in the area of e-prescribing and administration in the hospital. On the top right hand side, we can't lead everything from Wellington, so we're actually asking your DHBs to consistently work regionally on the, what we call the big hospital systems, the patient administration, the imaging, the PACS, uh, e-pharmacy, the clinical workstation. And let's just be clear, and I'll come back to this, but some regions are doing this better than others. We're working on a group of national solutions down the bottom left there. Uh, Finance, procurement, supply chain, gee, we might want to have a chat about HBO a bit later on. Um, cancer information, cardiac health, making very good pro progress. Maternity, I'll talk about. We actually are rolling out a comprehensive clinical assessment for aged care throughout New Zealand. We have over 40,000 uh, clinical assessments already sitting in a national database. And again, we might come back to 
aged care, because obviously it's a growth area. So, and then the last thing is we're working on what we call integrated care. So this is the patient portals. And I'll just make one observation here. You know, we, we use a 90-10 model. Uh, it's always difficult when you generalise, but generally 90% of New Zealanders are relatively well. They're either very well or they're a little bit, you know, worried well, or they might be a little bit at risk in managing something reasonably easily within a general practice environment. But clearly there are 10%, give or take, who are struggling for lots of different reasons, either chronic conditions, uh, maybe they're recovering from an accident, a range of other services. And we think the systems they want to engage with will be slightly different. So the patient portal I talked to you earlier is really for someone who is well and having episodes of care. It may work into chronic care, but it sort of comes to a point at some point. And we think the transition to the 10% is when there are multiple clinicians involved. So when a consumer is, really is recovering from a terrible car accident, and there are a large number of health providers, including people, the specialists who are in the hospital, all interested in ensuring that that patient has the clearest recovery plan possible and are fully engaged and uh, empowered to develop that plan. So you will hear us talk about two concepts in integrated care. We talk about patient portals for people generally who are well or managing a, a condition. And then we talk about shared care plans, which are the people who have got a real recovery plan that they need to own, they need to be able to log into, and they need to be able to see their care team who are working with them. Okay, so I've got three case studies, and uh, you might recognise some people at the top there. Um, four years ago when we started, we got told that there is no way the obstetricians, the midwives, and the GPs will come together to have a single maternity system. It just will not happen. So we put them in a room, and we didn't let them leave until they agreed they had to fix the problem. And there, here are the three people who, who hung in there and have gone to every governance meeting over the last three years to ensure that we can go live with a national system. So Mark Peterson, GP from uh, Hawke's Bay, uh, Norma Campbell, uh, who's a midwife and senior part of the College of Midwives, and Ian Page, who's with us here today. And uh, g'day Ian, and you know how hard some of those meetings have been. So what's happened? Well, three years commitment by this joint clinical group facilitated by the National Health IT Board, and there's a lesson in there. There needed to be a controlling mind to just keep people coming back to the table and fixing the problem. And I do want to acknowledge Tony Cook, who's been amazing as the chair of that group and making sure that all of this hangs together. We employed a very smart program manager who'd done a number of these sort of projects before. We went out to the market and did what's called active procurement, where lots of clinicians get in the room and actually see the software working before they make a decision about which partner they want to work with. And we chose a company called CleverMed from Edinburgh. Now, some of you might go, oh, good. We chose a really smart international company. But I went, oh, my God, how do we convince a small software company in Edinburgh to come down to New Zealand and do a great job for us, not just for a week or a month, but for the next 10 years? So just be aware that we're very excited about the product, but the challenge the IT board had to think through is how do we encourage them to want to come to New Zealand part of our program, make the business model effective for them to want to build a capability that we could rely on. We then had to work with lead DHBs because we're in a world where there are 20 of them and you can't get all 20 to say yes in one go and you wouldn't want them to because you can't deliver it to all of them. So I want to acknowledge Mid Central and Counties who really took the bulk of the leadership work. There were five uh, lead DHBs but Mid Central and Counties did most of the work. And over the last two months, five DHPs have gone live. Now that's when it gets exciting. So just let me say that again slowly. Over two months, five DHPs putting all their children through, all their new babies through a national maternity system. Now that tells me I can roll out to the other 15 in the next two years confidently. Now, there's one other smart thing we did. Um, we didn't ask the DHPs to find capital to buy into the national maternity system. We used some national funding, not from an IT source, but from the Quality Improvement Program for Maternity Care. We got them to fund the software and the original changes to make it work in New Zealand. And then we've asked the DHBs to fund its ongoing operation. And we've asked them to do it on a per birth basis. So there's a price for the system per birth. Now what that means is in the maternity budget, instead of IT being over in the depreciation budget that the CFO worries about, 
It's now directly a line item in the maternity budget. And that means that they can turn their old maternity system off and ignore it, and they can just build this into a normal price. So they get a world-class system, they get it operating nationally, and they just have to pay an operating cost in order to keep it going. But it gets better. This platform has a full neonatal capability in it. So those children who then go on to a range of services uh, within the hospital environment don't have to drop out into another system. It captures the newborn hearing information and it allows the NHI assignment to, so that that child's information will be collected from then on in everywhere else in the health system. So we're very excited about that project. Now I've talked about patient portals and these seven wonderful people are all GPs, six of them are practicing GPs who have all had portals running with their patients and one of them is an academic GP who's just been to the US on a Harkness Fellowship. And I love these people because I just went and grabbed them and put them in a room. I asked the minister to come and congratulate them for becoming eHealth ambassadors and ever since they've been working incredibly hard for me to make sure that this is successfully rolled out to their colleagues. So it's about clinical leadership. And the first thing, I've mentioned a couple of these things, but we didn't go and ask, uh, we didn't try and build a single system. We went out to consumers. Um, we got them to, we understood internationally that they're more likely to take up a portal if their GP offers it to them than if the Ministry of Health offers it to them. We also found that there are five things they really, really want to do, not 105 things. So we didn't overcomplicate what we asked the portal providers to offer. Uh, the five things people want to do is they want to look at their clinical notes and med lists, they want to look at lab results as they come through, they want to do a repeat script, they want to schedule a future appointment, and they'd like to do some online secure mail with their doctor. And so five things are still challenging to take your GP colleagues through, however they are only five, and we're working incredibly hard to get them in play. The reason I said earlier the information's got to be high quality and up to date, and the key is a little bit like the maternity one. We've got to stop calling IT a depreciated asset and focus it on the services that it offers. So we focus very, very hard on um, the change of model that occurs when a percentage of your patients are now accessing a portal. And that's the exciting thing. Even these seven ambassadors will tell you it's not about 100% of their patients being on a portal. It's maybe 5 or 10%. But by taking 5 or 10% into a different way of operating, it takes the pressure off the whole practice. And it's about nurses and it's about other members of the practice team using the portal communication in order to stop the face-to-face -face pressure on our GPs. And there's a gentleman there, um, just the second to the bottom, right down the bottom, he's just above uh, Carl Cole. And his name's Brendan Ede, and he is from Tikaha, so a rural part of the Waikato. And he runs a very busy private practice, and he did not want this at all. It's possible he's got a little bit of a South African accent, I couldn't comment on that, but you know, he's, he's, he's firm about his views on general practice. And, uh, and I didn't do the work. In fact, one of the other gentlemen here, Damien Tomic from Hamilton, went out and worked him over, oh sorry, um, <laughs> talked to him carefully about the importance of introducing this new approach. Do you know, that smile he's got on his face is he's never had more fun in general practice. He says, it's not about 100% of my patients, but the ones who are engaging, and a lot of them are rural, so they're in farms, and, and a lot of them are the wives of farmers, are just, they are more engaged, and he's more engaged, and the world is better. Um, sorry, that last comment just told you that 39,000 New Zealanders are currently accessing portals, but we're trying to get that to grow a whole lot further. Okay, and the last case study I want to talk about is electronic prescribing. And um, you might notice right at the top of that screen, there's someone who's not a clinician. So I do want to acknowledge Chai Tua because he drove something called um, the Quick, the Quality Improvement something. I can't remember what the Quick stood for. But one of those items was medicine, and he did it because he knew this was a safety problem. He knew that we weren't getting things right for our patients every time. And he got alongside Paul Cressy, who's at the top there. And Paul Cressy is a wonderful... Uh, clinician, his background is, is pharmaceuticals, uh, he is a community pharmacist by training, and he's a very young 75-year-old, he's just amazing. And the two of them worked with the three clinicians underneath, so Elizabeth Plant from Taranaki, Andrew Bowers from Southern DHB, and David Ryan, who's showing off to the minister a year ago how this works at Waitematā DHB. And then uh, the picture at the bottom is stellar, and I'll just paint the picture, I'll paint the story behind this. 
So the first thing that Chai and Paul did is they realised that if we didn't have a single way of describing every pharmaceutical product in New Zealand, we were going to fail. So they went about and did a whole lot of work on creating the New Zealand list of medicines, the universal list of medicines. It's based on MedSafe, so any new medicine coming into New Zealand goes through a MedSafe process, it then goes on to the ULM, it then gets the Pharmac schedule associated with it. So that means we have a single system. And in fact, if you've got an iPhone, you can go and have a look at the app because it's on an iPhone. You can look up any drug in New Zealand and it's called the NZULM. We then put some work into a formulary. So attached to the NZULM, you actually have a standard formulary that talks about all of the additional information you need about drugs and drugs interaction. And that's based on the British formulary. It's come in through uh, uh, Murray Tilliard in Dunedin, who does this on behalf of the health system. So once we got those foundations in place, we could get on with actually solving problems around medicines throughout our health system. So MedChart I've mentioned, it's live in southern Taranaki, Wairamata. It costs $300 per bed per year. Now that's another one of those, get the depreciation away from IT and get it into a service area. Imagine how many patients you get through a bed in a hospital in any one year. $300 is chicken feed. Let's get on with it. So, Southern Taranaki and Wairamata rolling out all the time through all the awards, outstanding. Wairamata, I believe, is well over 400 beds into mental health, all sorts of areas. Southern, again, into the hundreds, uh, Invercargill Hospital as well. Taranaki just extending out to five or six wards at the moment. The second thing we did is we collected one system for e-prescribing in the community. So we have that operational now. It's called the NZ uh, EPS broker. And it means that when a GP presses uh, a prescription and it prints out, it also sends up into like an FPOS system the first part of the transaction. And when the patient takes their script around to the pharmacy, there's a barcode on it. And when they swipe the barcode, the second part of the transaction completes up into that system up in the cloud. And that means we have a full collection of every community prescription in New Zealand. And then we added a third system, which is national, and that is a MedRec system from Orion, and that is a system proven at counties, and that is getting rolled out consistently through New Zealand as well. So the exciting thing is that we're going to do meds once and do it really well. And the reason I've got Stella down the bottom is Stella is an allied health leader, but in fact, she's on the exec of Canterbury DHB. And, you know, if anyone's from Canterbury, you guys are just really smart. You know, you get on and do the right things by yourselves anyway, but when someone else has proven something, you really are quick to pick it up and say, let's go and take what they've learned and do it even better here. So let me tell you the story. Stella's an executive. She's a funder. She wanted this to go in very quickly into Canterbury. So she looked around and said, where do I get the expertise to roll this out? She did two things really well. She went to Southern and she convinced them to let them take their top clinician who was involved in the Southern project and their project manager, who had the IT skills, to come to Canterbury to do the work. She then agreed to let her team go to Invercargill and be part of the team rolling out in Southlands Hospital. And then that team came back and together they rolled out into mental health in Canterbury and they're about to roll out into their um, medical wards early next year. Now that's what I think smart. I want to see more of that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't want it just to be Canterbury. I want DHBs to stop feeling they've got to build everything locally. They've got to go and steal the good ideas and the software and the people from other parts and get the A team so that when they implement, it's fast, it's safe, and we get a good outcome. So I did say that I would make some observations about where we're at four years into this. And I wrote a note to my IT board members the other day that said, I'm really confident now we're at the end of the beginning. And I know that sounds a little bit naff, but the point is four high years of trying to achieve better outcomes around IT, and I think we've only just got to the beginning. I, this, I'm just starting to sense that people are stopping talking about capital and depreciation. They're starting to talk about operating models and how they want to run their business. They're serious about clinicians being involved. But I don't think, you know, we're still just at the beginning. And, and the way I describe it is this. If you were standing on a hill looking at a triathlon and all the athletes are coming into that transition between the swim and getting on the cycle, what I'm seeing right now is I'm looking down the road at the first cyclists and they're miles away and they're joining up in teams and starting to help each other and they're getting further and further down that road. And I look down in front of me and in the transition, 
I'm seeing people kind of milling around, they're kind of getting their, their shoes on to jump on their bike, they're trying to looking to see which person they're going to team up with to get down the road, because in cycling you all got to go together. And then worse than that, I look back into the swim and there's a boy, the last boy, and there are still people struggling to get around the last boy. So that's my assessment of e-health in New Zealand, that actually the winners are getting so far ahead of everyone. There's a lot of people who aren't yet quite worked out what they should be doing and how to do it, and yet there's lots of good examples around. And the ones I'm really worried about are the ones who are getting left behind. And I think as a group of clinicians, I need you to be aware we have a very wide gambit here. And the trick is, how do we not stop the ones getting ahead, and how can we get the ones that are well behind to come forward? So I'm just going back to those three principles, and I'm going to come back to this term around leadership. You know, the most important element of e-health is leadership. Why? Because the way you invest in e-health is you're investing in the way your business operates. And our leaders are here to help us work out how to operate our health system safely and efficiently and cost effectively. So we need to get our executive sponsorship, the people with the checkbooks who know which is the most important investment to make and how to make it safely to be really stepping up. We need our clinical leaders to be really engaged and interested in trying to improve the way we operate our health system. And we need smart IT people who come in behind and don't debate and create barriers, but actually get on and fix the things that we know that need to be fixed. So I stole it all line from the minister, because I did read his speech, and he did talk about this concept of Team Health New Zealand. And I thought I'd build on that around the term leadership challenge, because if we were going to be truly a Team Health New Zealand, we better agree on what our challenges are. And um, you'll decide on where you sit, but I'm going to put seven areas up and I'm going to give them as a continuum. So let's start on the first one. So if you're in a DHB that keeps focusing on its annual bottom line over the customer service that you're delivering, you might have a problem. And I'm looking for DHBs that absolutely focus on the customer experience, the care outcomes, so measurable outcomes that we can publish, and on trying to get the patient to manage their own care. Even if it's an oncology experience, it's got to be their experience that we are supporting them with, not the other way around. So the second thing on the left, what if um, you know, DHBs out there that you might be part of that keep wanting to measure the number of things, the number of transactions, the number of operations, compared to DHBs who are out there measuring the wasted time of clinicians and patients? The good news. There are DHBs out there who are measuring this, and it's great. And they are the ones getting ahead down the road with their cycling buddies. <laughs> okay, so let's keep going. So the DHBs that leave the ministry to, divide, uh, to drive investment in preventative care and population health initiatives, rather than DHBs who embrace the investment in their preventative and population health initiatives in their local communities to make them real for their communities. DHBs that deliver care in traditional locations and have some pilot initiatives. Don't you love pilots? And those pilot initiatives usually are underfunded, under-resourced, and seem to run out of steam quickly. Compared with DHBs that talk about delivering care in the best location for the consumer, talking to consumers and clinicians about how that's going to operate, and then organise the money to flow so it actually works and is sustainable. There are DHBs who do it, there's not many. So let's keep going, because this is supposed to be the controversial part. Uh, DHBs that invest in local systems and leave regional and national systems to others. Oh, I love these ones. Against DHBs who realise that actually investing in regional and national systems support the patient journey, and they are avidly trying to reduce the amount of investment on their local systems. DHBs that describe their organisation in terms of funding streams and departmental goals. I'm sure there's none like that out there. Versus DHBs that have a clear operating model and they have an organisational goal to focus on continuous improvement of that operating model as a totality. And, you know, Team Health New Zealand, if we're serious about it, that's what that means. It means we're all in this together. We need to understand how the whole system works. And my favourite, uh, CIOs who report to the CFO which simply means that it's all about depreciation and capital and uh, how much money we don't have, versus CIOs who report directly to the CEO or to the chief medical officer. And again, we have that in one case. Uh, it's in Canterbury. 
So Nigel Miller, Chief Medical Officer, has the CIO reporting to him. It's brilliant. And that means when the CIO comes and talks to the executive, he doesn't talk about capital and depreciation. He talks about how he is helping clinicians to be more effective. Okay, so we might um, pick up on some of these points. Um, now look, I've got this slide here. I guess I wanted to show you that there's a bit of academic rigor to what we're doing. We do a lot of work with a group called the MIT. Um, they're based out of Boston. They did a research on 250 smart organizations around the world and they said, which are the ones that have done the best in becoming digitally savvy, becoming really smart users of information and information technology? And they came up with this model and they said, look, Organisations who do this well understand where they fit on these four quadrants. So they understand whether they're down the bottom there in the purple in replication, and that's the franchise model, so that's your McDonald's. We want everyone to look the same, we want the processes to be identical, but we want freedom of the business to operate the, by the owners that are in that area. And then up the other side is organisations that don't want to look the same, but they want to be coordinated. So they want their information about the customers and all the customer journey to be consistent, but they don't all have to be under one banner and under one brand. And then there are the organisations that are in the unification where everything's consistent. They want to be absolutely perfect, and a bank would be a great example of being in the red area. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is where's health? And I'll confine it a little more. Where are we with a public health system in New Zealand? And I think it's really clear we're still in the green box. Now the question is, should we be in the green box? And my assessment is that we probably should be using all of these boxes for different parts of our business. And this is why health is complex. We actually have all four of these working at all times. The problem is we don't all agree on which parts fit into which boxes, and therefore we keep investing in strange ways and independently. So in fact, if you really asked me to put us in one box, I'd put us in the green box, because I just don't see enough replication and coordination going on. And I think our goal is to move into coordination in the right area. So I've talked to you about maternity. I didn't talk to you about NCHIP, but that's about a common way of collecting data about children and their health experiences. When we do national infrastructure, which is the NIP project that HBL have been working with us on, that's where we want one IT platform for the country. Well, then that's a franchise model. We don't want debate about that. We just want the same. When we talk about a patient portal, we're heading towards unification. We don't really want patient portals to be different depending on which one you choose. But we want a little bit of flexibility, so it's probably somewhere in the middle. But the one I really want to focus on is medicines. If we're serious about getting medicines absolutely safe and high quality throughout New Zealand, we have to be in unification. Single systems, single processes, single data, and that's what we've been driving to do. So the answer here is to be uh, high quality, we're gonna have to think really hard about these four quadrants, but the basic theme is we've gotta get away from green and we've gotta get more towards red by going through those other two quadrants. And so something of this order is what I'd like to see the health system working towards and then the information can flow to support that. Okay, last couple of slides. Um, we do have a plan for the next five years. Uh, the first thing and most critical is we've got to finish off what we started. Uh, there's a bunch of foundations that we've got to get completed. The second thing is we've got to continue to challenge new models of care out in the community. Uh, we want the medical home, we want people wearing devices, we need to think about how we're going to change, use telehealth. We're also got to get better access to data. We've just got to get data flowing around our organisation, both to measure the performance, but also to support patient journeys. And then we've got to think really hard about where personalisation of medicine is going. So personalisation can mean so many different things, and that's why it's our growth opportunity. Um, take two apps and call me in the morning is going to be the new mantra from our GPs. Now, I just read an article that said a lot of GPs like this idea, but they haven't worked out which apps, and a lot of the apps they look at, they're not that sure about. Uh, so we've got to do some more work on thinking about how might we have a formulary of apps, and then we can be confident that there are some apps out there that are valuable. Um, medicines that are scientifically designed. This is a huge challenge for Pharmac for the next 20 years. How are, they, how are we going to afford those personalised medicines? Herceptin was just the start of where the world is heading. We must go down this path, but we've got to be smart about how we do it. And then we've got to empower our patients. So they're going to be online, not just Googling health. They're going to be building networks of similar patients like them. 
and they're going to know more about their care, they're going to know about scientific studies that are going on, and we've got to be ready for them and be confident to be their partners in their care. So we think that's a huge opportunity. So look, I'll finish just uh, a quote by Sir Muir Gray. Um, I think he's absolutely outstanding. He's Chief Knowledge Officer at the NHS. And he talks about the fact that in the next 10, 20 years, we've got some really big revolutions coming from citizens being more knowledgeable, capable, and connected. Knowledge being much more open and not being uh, constrained within our uh, community of professionals, but much more widely known and technology that we still don't know where it's going to take us, but we know it's happening at a great speed. And so he simply said that our health professionals must take a lead in designing and building systems of care to support this revolution. And you know, my key point is if I can't encourage you to get involved, then others will. And it'll get built for us and then we'll come back to meetings like this and complain that it wasn't quite the way we wanted it. So thank you very much for listening and I look forward to a rich set of questions.